got the job on Monday. He started work on Tuesday. He turned 21 on Thursday. And uh, he was shot to death on Saturday. He finally got to the second page and he saw those words, I forgive you. And as tough a guy as he was, his eyes teared up. Nobody had ever said those words to him before in 28 years for anything, let alone the death of somebody else. In the United States of America, 34 states employ the death penalty. One such state, Connecticut, is known for its beautiful shoreline, bookstores, museums, art culture, and notable universities. It is the last place one would think to find the heated and controversial debate concerning the death penalty. And then, it all changed. In the summer of 2007, a horrific home invasion occurred in Cheshire, Connecticut. Jennifer Hawk Pettit and her two daughters were killed. After two exhaustive trials, both attackers were convicted and sentenced to death. The Cheshire home invasion unleashed a storm of debate about the death penalty in Connecticut that rages to this day. There are currently 12 inmates on death row. However, the death penalty has not been used since 2005 when serial killer Michael Ross was executed. The question still remains about whether or not the death penalty is a form of cruel and unusual punishment, which is discussed in the Eighth Amendment of the Constitution. We spoke with Stuart Brush and Walter Everett, whose sons were both murdered in Connecticut. The deaths of Dean Brush and Scott Everett have strengthened the views that these men hold. Brush described how his son was killed. last job that he got was delivering pizzas for Domino's Pizza in Bridgeport. And so he got the job on Monday. He started work on Tuesday. He turned 21 on Thursday. And he was shot to death in a robbery holdup on Saturday. Three minority boys got in and asked him for a ride. The boys uh, instructed Dean to go to a lonely part of the city and uh, there they held him up and they shot him three times but the fourth uh, bullet went through his brain. The neighbors heard the gunshots and uh, the ambulance was called and Dean was dead on the scene. The three boys that murdered Dean Brush were all convicted of their crimes. In exchange for a lesser sentence, two of the boys testified against Milton Green, the boy that actually pulled the trigger. Green was sentenced to 39 years. However, because of a violation of the Miranda Clause, he only served a seven-year sentence. Scott was uh, killed on July 26, 1987. He lived in Bridgeport, and uh, he came home late at night, and he had friends who came in with him, and he discovered that his apartment had been broken into. They had trashed his apartment, had stolen some things. And his friends finally got him calmed down. He walked them out to the car. He went to go back into his apartment and realized he had left his keys inside. He pounded on the door and said, uh, somebody let me in. And the offender came out of the end apartment. He was high on drugs. He had not slept for almost a week. And he pointed a gun at Scott and he said, get out of here or I'll shoot. Scott was just trying to get back into his apartment. There was a little confrontation, and the offender shot and killed him. Scott Everett's murderer, Mike Carlucci, was sentenced to five years in prison. On the day of his sentencing, Carlucci apologized for his actions. Everett decided to write a letter to his son's murderer. And spent a page and a half telling Mike how angry I was, and how depressed and lonely I was, and how it was destroying me. And I finally said, having said all of that, I want to thank you for what you said in court on the day you were sentenced. And as hard as these words are to write, I forgive you. And those were hard words to write because I didn't feel that. And I've come to realize that forgiveness depends not on feeling good about the other person, but feeling good, about, good enough about yourself that you want to heal. 
Both men find consolation in their line of work. Stuart Brush is a minister at the United Church of Christ, and Walter Everett is a retired United Methodist pastor. Their experiences have solidified their opinions on the death penalty, which fall on opposite extremes of the debate. One, I do find that the death penalty is accepted by the Bible itself. I like the one in Mark 9, uh, verse 42, where Jesus says, if you offend a little child, it would be better for you if a millstone was tied around your neck and you were dumped into the depths of the sea as a penalty for, uh, now that's the death penalty. I've always been opposed to the death penalty. In fact, I can remember giving a speech in a college public speaking course in 1953. When I spoke against the death penalty in class, I got a reaction as if it was to say, huh? It was like nobody thought that was an issue. But I felt it was an issue because I've always felt that we don't have a right to take anybody else's life no matter what they've done to us. Both Reverend Brush and Reverend Everett shared their views on the death penalty in regards to whether it is a form of cruel and unusual punishment. I'm not so sure about that. Now I had two little dogs, Willie and Hannah, and we put them to sleep. In other words, we gave them the death, death penalty. Now, cruel and in, inhumane? No, it was because we loved them so much that we didn't want them to suffer and they didn't suffer. So it couldn't possibly have been cruel and inhumane. Not as in cruel and inhumane as uh, shooting a guy two days after his 21st birthday on the streets of uh, Bridgeport. I was talking with one of the state legislators one time. He said to me, we've got to have the death penalty. This is a frontier society. I said, frontier, we were in Hartford. I said, in the early days of people moving west, if somebody committed a crime, they had no jails to lock them up. And if they were violent, they would wind up hanging them or killing them in some other way. But we have a better way of doing it now. Reverend Brush compared the death penalty to an experience he had while living in Greenwich, Connecticut. The policeman called me and the policeman said, Reverend Brush, your mailbox has been destroyed. And he said, how much do you think that the mailbox cost? And I said, well, uh, to buy a new mailbox and to install it would probably be no more than $28.05. He said, all right, well, we have the people who killed your mailbox, and so we will collect the money from them. This will be their penalty, and you will receive a check in the mail for $28.05, and I did. This plate of justice over here, this plate of justice over here, A equals B. Here's your $28.05, and here's your mailbox. No. That's justice. Over here is life. What are you going to put over here? Life in prison without parole? No, oh, if you put in life here, then what offsets that is life. Reverend Everett spoke about finding a way to heal. I don't feel the death penalty solves anything. In fact, I've known people who have waited 20 or more years for an execution, and then they've said after it, why don't I feel any better? Well, it hasn't brought back their loved one. And as a result, uh, they continue down the path of anger, and they feel as though they didn't get what they promised closure and as a friend of mine says you don't get closure when somebody is executed you get closure when you buy a house and you get a mortgage and I think he's right you don't get closure you have to find a path toward healing and it may take a long time but it certainly begins more more quickly if you're not facing the possibility of an execution of somebody who's 20 or more years down the road in early April 2012, the Connecticut State Senate voted 20 to 16 to pass a bill to repeal the death penalty in Connecticut after 11 hours of debate. On April 11, 2012, the Connecticut House of Representatives passed this bill with an 86 to 62 vote. The debate lasted 10 hours. 
Governor Malloy signed the bill into law on April 25, 2012. Repealing the death penalty will only apply to new criminals. Those that were already sentenced to death will remain on death row. According to a recent Quinnipiac University survey, 62% of Connecticut voters supported the death penalty for murderers, but they were split down the middle when deciding between the death penalty or life in prison without parole. Despite the recent retraction of this controversial punishment, it is clear that those who hold strong opinions regarding the death penalty will always defend their position passionately. Though the political battle is over at this point, the emotional aspects of the death penalty debate will always be strong. When we kill somebody else, we get into the violence ourselves. And it's not only cruel and unusual for the, the person being killed, it's cruel and unusual for society. I don't think that we can promise these people that they're going to live after they've taken the life. The, there's gotta be the $28.05.